Teachers in England have been told they do not have to address pupils in their chosen pronouns under new government guidance on how best to support transgender students. The draft document released by the Department of Education states in the absence of preferred pronouns, the child's preferred name should be used with schools having a duty to ensure bullying is never tolerated. So to discuss this development, I'm joined by the journalist and author Helen Joyce. Helen, thanks so much for joining us. This guidance is long overdue, isn't it? And it's, it's absolutely necessary. Yes, this guidance has been under development since 2017. It was originally tasked to the Equality and Human Rights Commission under its previous management, which was very, very transactivist, um, very connected with Stonewall. Uh, there was a leaked document that really totally misrepresented the law and suggested that children could really change sex and that if a child said they were a member of the opposite sex, it was the school's legal duty to go along with that. And that was withdrawn and never actually published formally. And since then, that's been a hot potato in Westminster. It's been bounced around. It went back to the Department for Education. We went through several ministers. The Equalities Minister, Kenny Badenoch, is the person who has pushed it. Number 10 has come and gone in different positions on it. And finally, finally, more than six years later, this document has come out. And in the meantime, of course, lots and lots of children have been transitioned at school. And the trans sort of social epidemic has spread for six years unchecked. And the people who have misrepresented the law to teachers have been free to do so. So to say it's long overdue doesn't even really capture the problem. Now, how watertight is the guidance? Because, for instance, uh, the lawyer Robin Moira Wright was, uh, was on GB News saying that it was unlawful and that actually schools have no, effectively saying schools have no responsibility to provide, for instance, single sex uh, spaces such as toilets and the like. Is that incorrect? Uh, Robin Moira White. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of misrepresentation, misrepresentations in what White says, I'm sorry to say. Uh, it's non-statutory guidance, so that's the first thing. Um, but the second thing to say is that it goes through the legal basis for the points that it makes. And so a teacher or a school that decides to ignore that legal basis, even though it's non-statutory guidance, will be ignoring statutory duties. So for example, there is, despite what White says, a legal duty to provide single sex uh, toilets from age eight in English schools and changing rooms and showers if those are offered at all, single sex from age 11. And there's no wiggle room on that. Uh, children under 18 can't get a gender recognition certificate, so their legal sex is, in all circumstances, the same as their biological sex. So have schools the understood same is true that? For the records. I mean, have no, schools... because they don't need to. Right. It, it, honestly, um, lobby groups have been going around telling them that the protected characteristic of gender reassignment, which is something completely different, it's thinking that you want to be a member of the opposite sex in some respect, like that's not the formal wording. They've been saying that if a child has that protected characteristic, you must treat them as if they're the opposite sex. And you absolutely mustn't. There's many, many statutory duties on schools that require them to pay attention to children's sex. Now, you mentioned social, uh, the, the idea of a social contagion, and I want to ask you uh, specifically uh, about that, because um, some people, for instance, the interim CAS review, suggested that social transitioning, as in using the preferred pronouns and the preferred names of, of children, that the, it's not a neutral act. Um, so that being the case, um, should schools, should this have gone further? Should the guidance have said that there shouldn't be any social transitioning whatsoever, because that will just add to this idea of a contagion? So Sex Matters, the organisation that I work for, has done a full analysis of the various laws and duties that bind on schools because they go a lot beyond the Equality Act. They include safeguarding principles, for example. Every education professional has a legal duty to safeguard children. And we think that if you take in the round all the laws and regulations that bind on schools, they can never pretend that a child is a member of the opposite sex. Uh, that is not the um, interpretation of the expensive lawyers that the government turned to, as far as we can tell from the leaks. But I think those lawyers were you know, myopically looking just at equality law, and they don't understand anything about how you run a school. So what they've ended up with is a strange sort of muddle. There's really good stuff in there, but they've got this weird muddle where they understand that you must have school rules with no exception that insist that only girls can use the girls' spaces and only boys can use the boys' spaces, and not one child in the Whole, whole of Britain in any circumstances should be thought of as a member of the opposite sex and that's legally sound and then they say that in some circumstances you might refer to a child as a member of the opposite sex well you may have noticed that school rules are written in words so how can you have a school rule that says to a boy you're not allowed into the girls toilets but by the way you're a special sort of boy that we call a girl this is just not coherent and we hope to tighten it up in the process of consultation 
I mean, you've got to feel sorry for the teachers in all of this, because uh, a lot of this guidance was surely to make lives easier for them, right? <laughs> And for school leaders, it's school leaders who carry the legal responsibility here. It's been a gross dereliction of duty by the Department for Education not to put this out a lot earlier. It's left around 30,000 schools around Britain trying to make decisions in this complex area under pressure from teachers, activists, some activist teachers as well, and making those decisions in a space where they know they're quite likely to get sued by people on both sides, by parents who want their children to transition, they want their boy to be treated as a girl or vice versa, and other parents saying under no circumstances do this. I should say I really am impressed that Kemi Badenoch got it to this point. Uh, I understand that it's her who has made it as tough as and clear as it is. I think that in the end we're going to have to get to the point that we say no boy can be a girl and you're going to have to say that in your language. If people want to change their names that's fine but you can't pretend boys are girls or girls are boys and keep all children safe and that is the primary duty of schools. So finally on that, how will that be achieved? I've already said that some uh, lawyers are saying that this is unlawful guidance. Some are suggesting that by the end of the consultation period it will change and it will be watered down. Uh, Stonewall has come out and they, they're, they're not happy at all with this guidance. So there's a lot of powerful lobbying groups and activist groups who are determined uh, to have this unpicked and pulled apart and that it won't be applied. So how do you deal with that? How do we ensure that actually uh, it does go through and is as rigorous as it needs to be? I mean, the stuff about spaces and sports having to be single sex is so clearly worked and it's so obviously based on statutory responsibilities on schools that it's amazing to me that that was ever ignored in the first place. I think all these teachers who are mouthing off under anonymous accounts on Twitter saying that they're not going to follow this guidance, like once they get into their mind that actually that's going to have them up before um, the professional bodies on fitness to practice and that they're going to lose their jobs, I think that that's just, you know, that's Saturday night um, bravado, isn't it? So I, th I think it's that. I think it's the fact that it gives its legal workings. And, you know, the trans activist groups, they've really worked very well in the shadows. They've managed to present all these misrepresentations when nobody was looking. And now that it's out in the cold light of day and it's written down, I think all these people are really going to have second and third thoughts. And also, finally, I would say that school leaders are often much less activist than the activist teachers. They're quite sensible people generally, because they tend to be the people who have to get the insurance policy and talk to the legal counsel about what the school is doing. I think that this actually will stick uh, pretty well. Well, Helen, thanks so much for taking us through that. It's very complicated, really appreciate it. Have a really great Christmas, by the way. <laughs>